Thank you, Miss Mitchell. Appreciate that very much. Have your Bibles open to 1 Timothy chapter number 3 tonight. 1 Timothy chapter number 3. If you need a handout tonight, we have some as we look at this, continue the series on which church and why this church. So if you need a handout, if you'd raise your hand, and the ushers will come find where you're at, and they'll sell one to you for $100. Now, what if I could? No, we'll give them to you free. I just ask you not to draw too many pictures on them and take some notes as we continue on our series about the church. Remember, the church was not our idea. The church was God's idea. This is not just some big Ponzi money-making scheme, but this is supposed to be the assembly surrounded around one central idea. The church is to be centered around one idea, and that idea is a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. The church is centered around Jesus Christ. The Bible says that Jesus, that is he, is the head of the body, that is the church, the firstborn of the dead. And so we're here because of Jesus Christ. Are you glad to be at church tonight? I'm glad to be at church and great to see your smiling faces. I'm excited that all the children are off in the SOS, Servants of the Savior program, where they learn tremendous truths from God's Word and some practical things as well. And we have many young people up there and many of you uh, either helping or help during the night, and you'll sometimes see adults leaving the service around 8 o'clock. It's not because they're tired of me, or I should say not the only reason because they're tired of me, but because they're also going to the next part of the SOS. They have boy classes and girls classes, and they teach things like pet care and safety. In fact, uh, my children have been coming home and telling me the different lessons they've learned. And Brother Coral is here. He's probably up there right now. And he was teaching, they were telling me about uh, some of the CPR for children that my kids were experiencing and practicing. And so this is just tremendous. I guess if I begin to choke one day that they will, they will solve that problem for me. And I I'm, I'm, guess I should be grateful for that. My odds are probably better if they don't touch me, but we'll probably let them give a whirl. But I appreciate everyone serving in that. Thank you, uh, those who participate in that and help in that ministry, in our, in our children's ministry. Again, thank you for all the, the folks. The, um, uh, we have the tech and all the music and all the different departments. I am glad you heard Brother Brady sing tonight. He's a blessing around here, is he not? He is, and I was glad when uh, we spoke a few weeks back and he agreed to come back, and he's going to help us here on staff a little bit here and with the music, so we're glad to have him, and he'll be starting in a little bit here. And so he's not drawing a paycheck yet, but pretty soon, and that point then we'll really put him to work, right? And, uh, he, but he's just a blessing and a help along the way. So thankful for what God's doing here at First Baptist Church. Looking forward to Easter. Looking forward to Easter at First Baptist Church. Of course, we're, uh, we're able to procure three different, three, three different TV stations. I believe it's Fox 66, NBC 25, and CW 46. And on Easter morning at 11 o'clock a.m., all three stations will, uh, Lord willing, will broadcast the message. We're going to record that this week and next week, the songs and the message. have to do all that ahead of time. You can't do that live on TV. They just don't like that scenario in any way, shape, or form. So many hoops, so you have to pre-record it. So we'll pre-record that message. And don't worry, you won't miss anything by being here at church that morning. All right, if you remember last year, there were a number of different video elements and special music, and I have, uh, uh, or we have, we have made the, the service almost the same. There'll be a little bit more at church than there is on TV because of some time restraints on TV. So you come to church, you get more, but you won't miss anything by coming to church on Easter Sunday. And so I'd ask you to use it as a tremendous or a huge outreach ministry. And maybe folks who aren't comfortable coming to church yet say, listen, would you watch us on TV this morning? 11 o'clock in, we'll have a card for you to hand out. It'll be on our Easter tract, and uh, we'll put it on Facebook as well. And you just invite and share that and spread that everywhere. We'll see what the Lord will do. I remember last year we already had stories of people getting saved because of the Easter broadcast. And we're praying again. The Lord takes the gospel, and he does something powerful with it. And we'll try to do our job in presenting it in a way that is attractive, that is relevant, all right, that does not hinder the gospel. But the Holy Spirit has to work in hearts. But he won't if no one hears it. All right, and so we got to do our part, and that's inviting people. But invite them to church as well. And I think people are, are well, not think. You can see them. They're gradually coming out and, and doing more and more. And I think they'd love to come to church. That Saturday, the, the Saturday before Easter, we'll have a big Easter egg community, Easter egg hunt. At three locations in Birch Run, I believe Saginaw, and then here at the church. And looking forward to giving the gospel in those ways and inviting those folks back for Sunday morning. And wouldn't it be great to have them all back here Sunday morning? It'd just be a tremendous thing. We'll preach the gospel there and preach it Sunday morning. If you didn't notice, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, is about Jesus Christ and the resurrection. The one thing or one of the main truth that separates us from every other religion is that the God that we worship is not dead. 
We're going to look at that tonight as we look at which church or why this church. You could give a whole lot of reasons why this church. Say, wow, we have friendly people at First Baptist Church, and we do have friendly people at First Baptist Church. And that is a, a kudos to you, and congratulations to you as a church family. You make people feel welcome at First Baptist Church. They expect me as a pastor to say hello. Right? You kind of, that's my job, to say hello to people and hello to visitors. But when you, as a church family, go and talk to people and say, we're glad you're here, boy, that's a big, big deal. And you do a good job of that. I appreciate that. Uh, on that note, if there's ever somebody at church that you don't recognize, I'm going to help you here, right? So you can write this in the notes. If I don't recognize somebody, you can write that down. If I don't recognize somebody, I will go introduce myself. Wouldn't that be great? Hello, I'm, I'm J.D., and your name is R.B. Ouellette. Oh, I didn't recognize you, Pastor. <laughs> no. Uh, you know what? Along the way, this is what happens. We, we see somebody, and we think, boy, I should know them, but I don't recognize them. And, boy, they'll be offended if I ask their name, and, and they'll get mad at me. They'll leave the church. They'll probably forsake God, and they won't, you know, it'll be just a mess. Their family will fall apart, and the job will fall apart. The, the economy in Michigan will fall apart. The United States will fall apart. The world will fall apart, all because I asked their name. What you'll find out is you're like, oh, this is my name. And, oh, how long have you been going here? 35 years. Cool. <laughs> right, where do you go from there? Nowhere, just let the awkward silence just hang there. It's all right, but you ought to know the people around you, and if you don't recognize somebody, it is A-OK. -okay. It is encouraged that you say, hey, I am, I'm J.D., what's your name? And I've had to do that even as I became pastor. There were some people I didn't recognize all the time. Hey, what's your name? Oh, I've been here for 45 years. Praise the Lord. I'm excited, so I really need to know your name. If you've been here 45 years. And uh, no, I'm Doreen. Oh, that's your my wife. I thought I recognized you. But you meet people, but be friendly. People come in the church, you, you say hello to them. If they're sitting by themselves, sit with them. And uh, see if they want to sit with somebody. Sometimes in this day and age, they may say, oh, I prefer to sit by myself. That's no problem. But we ought to be the friendly church. And that'd be one reason why we'd say come to First Baptist Church. And that's a decent reason, but that's maybe even a good reason, but not the best reason why you've got to come, come to this church. Well, because we have services three times a week, and I think we ought to have services three times a week. I think that's the right way to do it. I think that's a good thing. Help us grow Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. I think it helps us in our Christian walk. I've been in church three times a week since before I was born. I remember someone told me once when they were realizing that some churches were cutting out services. And one of the pastors, a uh, dear old man, said, well, I guess it's just a waste, or just a bother that I've been going to Sunday night church my whole life. Think about all those sermons I didn't have to hear. Boy, I remember many times that God touched my heart in a Sunday morning or a Sunday night or a Wednesday night. I'm thankful for that, but even that's not, it's a good reason, but not the best reason. And tonight I want to give us some reasons why we come to, to this church and then beyond that, why, we, why we're Baptists. And so let's have a word of prayer. Let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 3, first of all, though, verse 15 and 16, where Paul says, But if I tarry long, that thou mayest know how thou oughtest to behave thyself in the house of God, which is, the sort, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and ground of the truth, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. Lord, I thank you for the time we have tonight. Lord, I ask you to help us. Lord, I pray that as we go through some of these truths and these notes through your verses and your word, Lord, you would touch our hearts. Lord, that you would strengthen our faith, strengthen our resolve for you. Lord, may you help us to differentiate between those things that are true and those things that are not true. Lord, I pray that if there's someone who's maybe struggling with a particular truth, that you touch their heart tonight. And Lord, we love you. We thank you for what you're doing here at this church and the lives that you're touching and changing. Lord, the salvations, the baptisms, the marriages putting back together again, Lord, and the healing among sick people. Lord, we love and we're, we're honored and humbled to see you work. Lord, bless this time now. In Jesus' name, amen. If you have your notes there, we're talking about which church, why this church. The first blank there is the call to the church. The church is, is called to be supported by the truth. The, the church is the pillar and ground of the truth. That means we hold up Jesus Christ and we're a pillar that holds it up. We are not the source of the truth. Jesus is the source of the truth. Jesus in John chapter 14, verse 6 says, I am the way, the 
truth and the life. Jesus is the source of the truth. God is the source of all truth. We as a church uphold with truth and by truth. We are called to be supported by the truth. The second blank there, we're called to speak the truth. A church, we should, not, uh, we should not run from saying things that may be interpreted as controversial. But I don't have to run to say things just to be controversial. I may along the way say things that offend you. If I do, if you're waiting for me to apologize, I'm not going to. If it's the truth and the, and the truth that you find offensive, then I'm sorry for your sake. Many times the truth in my life offends me. My flesh does not like the truth. Does your flesh like the truth? My flesh doesn't like the truth. My flesh likes to be itself. My flesh doesn't like a soft answer to turn away wrath. My flesh says, listen, you've got the perfect sarcastic answer, and that will not only turn away wrath, it'll shut down the situation. That's what my flesh likes. But the truth says, no, Howell, shut your mouth. That offends me. That offends me. But, but, but the, truth, the church is called to speak the truth. Now, that is not an excuse. That is not a, a blank check uh, for you to go around speaking your mind to everyone else at church. Well, there's a few things I have to say to you. Well, I've got something on my mind. I just got to speak my mind. You know, I'm old, I'll just say what I want to say. I can't wait till I'm old. And I get to say what I want to say. Now, I'm not picking on you uh, if you're old or young. I'm picking on you if you think that you get to just speak the truth whenever you want to. Remember, we looked at that passage in Ephesians, and the beginning of the passage and the end of the passage is surrounded and encompasses the truth with love. I just love you. Now I'll tell you what I want to say. No. It's like when someone says, now don't be offended. All right. What you want to say is, okay, well, just don't speak. Then there's no chance I'll be offended. But, you know, if someone says don't be offended, then you get offended. Well, I told you not to be offended. You know, well, what you said was offensive to me. But we're called to speak the truth, but in love. Number three, the church is called to strive for the truth. We're supposed to be passionate about the truth. I care about the truth. I care that you know the truth. I want to communicate the truth. Along the way, I am sure that I will misspeak on something. There's no way that you could speak three times a week for 30 to 35 minutes and not along the way say something incorrectly. The odds are not in my favor. We ought to strive for the truth. If you think I said them incorrectly, I'd ask you to wait till after the service, perhaps, as opposed to the middle of the service, but say, Pastor, you know what? You said this. What did you mean? And, and listen, but we ought to strive for the truth. I care about the truth. I care when other pastors say the wrong things. I'm like, boy, that's, I, I, that's awful. The church is called to strive for the truth. We went on last week and we talked about the confusion in church. There's a number of different types of churches that can cause confusion. There's confusion in the types of churches. There's confusion in the teaching of churches. And there's confusion in the traditions of churches. Now understand, when I teach on some of those things, I cannot be all-inclusive. There is no way for me to go through every single religion and teach everything. Uh, I, there's no time to do that. I could preach till I die and not hit every concept in the Bible, right? And, uh, and so I just wanted to paint a few overviews, and we looked at uh, some of the Catholic beliefs, some of the Missouri Synod Lutheran beliefs, some of the Mormon beliefs, and some of the progressive church beliefs. And you find it if you want to hear what that says, go back and watch that from last week. Uh, but there, I don't want to be all-inclusive, nor am I trying to insult other religions. My purpose in that is not to insult someone else. My purpose is to, along the way, present the truth. If the truth is offensive, then I am sorry. There was a well-known Southern Baptist uh, preacher, well-known Southern Baptist preacher about two or three years ago, released a book. It's in my office, in my study. In this book, he says that Muslims and Christians worship the same God. We do not worship the same God. We don't. Let there be no confusion. I hope that people don't find that offensive. I'm sorry if they do. But the God of the Bible and the God of the Quran are not the same God. They don't say the same things. Right? They don't have the same attitude. They do not have the same beginning. 
my God has no beginning. They do not have the same, uh, the same prophets, all right? I have prophets that we know about. Jeremiah was a prophet, Isaiah, well, they were real prophets. None that I can find are named Muhammad. All right, we don't serve the same God. And I'm sorry that this man said that. I'm sorry he believes that. I don't mean to insult him, but I do stand in correction of that statement. A while on TV, there was a well-known evangelist. And he said, well, we all kind of get to heaven the same way. Now, on that face value, that is true. We all get to heaven the same way. There's only one way. His name is Jesus. But you understand that's not what he meant. He meant, well, we all get there and, and the, uh, the, uh, the Islam faith may get there this way and the Mormons may get there this way and the Christians may get there this way and the Catholics may get there this way and we all kind of get there and God's going to sort it all out. God is going to sort it all out. He's already told us, unfortunately, for those, how he will sort it out. Either we believe in Jesus and believe in the name of Jesus and the death, burial, and resurrection. All right? That's the gospel found in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4. Either you believe in Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross and how he died, buried, rose again, or you don't believe in that. That's the sorting that takes place. And if you've believed in it, then your name is in the Lamb's book of life. If you have rejected that, then you're not found written in the book, and you have to depart into eternal separation. The Bible calls that before hell, at that point, the lake of fire, later on. There is a lot of teaching, unfortunately, that does not line up with this book right here. What happens sometimes is that we get feeling badly about things. Ah. <sighs> This person's really sincere, and they're a really nice person. How do I tell them that though they're sincere and though they're very nice, their whole life they've not believed the right thing from the Bible? Well, how do you tell them? You tell them in a spirit of love. You say, my friend, let me share with you what God says. The church has to be passionate about the truth. I'm not trying to insult. I do desire to instruct. Remember this from last week. Some things under traditions, some things don't matter. In the church realm, some things do not matter. When our choir sings, our choir wears suits and dresses, all right? They don't wear robes. Other choirs wear robes. Do I think that's good or bad? I don't really care. If I came to First Baptist Church and, and we wore robes in choir, I don't care. Some clergy have different outfits, right? Some bigger collars, some long robes, isn't that? Clothes, I'm sorry, they, they really don't matter. My mom's in Puerto Rico right now visiting my, my grandmother. She's still living there and uh, still alive. And, um, you know, she's 96, I think, 96, 97. I'm going to get it wrong. My mom's watching. I'll get a text about that tonight. So she's like 43. She's real young. Um, if I was pastoring in Puerto Rico, I don't think I'd wear a suit coat and a tie. Because I'm Puerto Rican and I sweat like a Puerto Rican. That place is humid. My grandfather, before he passed, one of the last things he did was build a church building. Beautiful, beautiful $5 million, I believe it's $5 million building. Gorgeous. My grandfather worked with churches and he was a project manager. Maybe where I get some of that tendency. And beautiful thing, has a, has a baptismal, had a baptismal that sat about right here. There was like a 12-foot wall behind this baptismal where the water rushed down. And about eight foot, it hit another one and rushed down again into the baptismal tank. Just a gorgeous, gorgeous full wall of windows on either side. No air conditioning. We had his funeral there. I was in a, in a black suit for the funeral. Woo, man. <laughs> Yikes. And you know what? If someone over there not wearing a suit and tie, or a suit coat and a tie, you know what? Some things don't matter. Some things really just don't matter. Now, we do some things at First Baptist Church. Why we do them matters, and I'm not asking to change. I'm just saying we, we get bent out of shape about some of these things. People have got bent out of shape about what color shirt the pastor wears. I'm sorry. If I want to wear a blue one, I want to wear a blue one. What time we start the service. But some things, some things matter. 
Some things are not just preference. We dealt with this some last week. The Bible that we use matters, church. It matters. It matters what Bible we use. I mentioned some last week about the different translations, and I will probably at some point come back and teach through that. Pastor Led did a, just a phenomenal job when he wrote those lessons. They wrote a book after that. I'm teaching through it in our Bible class right now. These seniors are inside of it. But it matters what Bible you use and why you use the Bible. We use at First Baptist Church the King James Version of the Bible. We use that one week because we believe that the King James, or we know it comes from what's called the Textus Receptus, the Greek text, that we believe God has developed divinely preserved that Greek text, and this is, the, this is the accurate translation from the correct text. Not every Bible uses the same manuscripts to translate from. In fact, I was teaching uh, in the class this past week, Matthew chapter 18, 11 says this, for the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. That's a good verse, isn't it? If you were to look it up, and I looked it up for the, for the boys uh, online, I looked it up in the English Standard Version, the ESV. You know what it says when you type in an ESV in Bible Gateway, Matthew 18, 11, It'll say, error, not error, it'll say, no results. It's not there. You can't find it. It's not in there. If you, if you go to the same thing to the NIV, it says, not there. If you go to the New King James, it has it there with a note. Underneath the note, it says, this is not found in the ancient manuscripts. It, it, and then... This, I could repeat those things. There's a number of those instances. It is a big deal which one we use. I I mentioned about my daughter, Danielle. She reads, she's eight years old, reads from the King James every morning. There's times she doesn't get it. I was reading about a a former classmate of mine, and he has this series out. He is actively trying to get people to not read from the King James. He's on a mission. He says it's just way too confusing and it's wrong. And he has these words that uh, he calls false friends. And uh, one word he uses in an illustration is the word halt. And uh, in the Old Testament, where it says, how long halt ye between two, two opinions? All right, and the idea from the Hebrew there is, you have this, do you serve God or do you serve Baal? Which one will you choose? You know, which, which one will you follow? Elijah, it's the story of Elijah and the prophets. Remember, all the prophets are going, he's, and they're having a big old party trying to get Baal to come out, and, and Elijah's sitting there, and I love this part of the Bible because Elijah is sarcastic. Oh, where's Baal? Is he on vacation? All right, and, he, and they're just getting more worked up because Baal's not answering. Oh, is he sleeping? Yell louder. Oh, no. And Elijah gets up with just a simple prayer and all this water and the God of heaven, you're in my God, comes down with fire, burns it and consumes it all up. <laughs> Our God doesn't sleep. Our God doesn't go on vacation. Elijah asked that day, how long halt ye between two opinions? Pretty confusing word, is it not, halt? You would understand that to mean, how long do you waver between two opinions, would you not? Hesitate would be another word you could use. Well, this particular former classmate of mine says, well, what I realized was that word is, is not the same. What it means is to limp between different opinions. And that Hebrew word, one of the, one of the uh, um, interpretations could be limp. It's true. It doesn't change the meaning if you want to use the word limp. How long do you go back and forth between two? Uh, my problem is that my buddy, not my buddy, but my former classmate likes to use all different versions. Every other version except for one agrees with the King James. Even in his analysis, why not to read the King James, he still disagrees with everything else. There is so much confusion out there. And the issue is, this is a big deal. What translation? Can you imagine if I said, okay, turn to Matthew chapter 18, verse 11. Well, pastor, I don't have that one. I just can't seem to find it this morning. I was in a church service, visiting a church, where the teacher, with my wife, we were there, and the teacher turned to a passage, and they were using different versions in the Sunday school class. And he read it, and a dear old lady raised her hand. Excuse me. Yes, ma'am. My Bible doesn't say that. Oh, what does yours say? And she reads it. And she was right. It didn't say that. Another lady raised her hand. My Bible doesn't say that. Oh, what does yours say? She said, well, mine says this. Oh, okay. He's like, oh, that's neat. Or whatever he said. He was just like, oh, that's a great thing. Can you imagine the confusion? So there are some things that do matter. 
Tonight I want to look at it in your notes, what's called the, under the notes, the conviction of our church. There are five fundamentals of our faith. Now we will look at later on why we are Baptists. This is not why we're Baptists. This is what I would call the five fundamental, five fundamentals of someone who is a Christian. Now that doesn't mean necessarily just because they believe these five things, all right, that we could worship in the same church together. There's other things that also matter. But these five fundamental ideas, these five fundamental doctrines have to be correct in order for someone to be a Christian. For me to have some type of Christian fellowship with this, these five fundamentals have to be in order. If someone does not agree on these five fundamentals, then we do not see eye to eye. We are not the same if these five don't, aren't just like this. Let me give you the five tonight. We'll look at them briefly, and then that'll be for tonight. So first one is this one in your notes. We must agree, first of all, on the deity of Jesus Christ. In order for someone to be a Christian, in order for me to now have fellowship on a fundamental level, they must believe that Jesus Christ is God. They cannot just believe that he is a God or that he will be a God or that he was a God, but that Jesus Christ is deity. He is God. There is no room on these, no room on these for interpretation. Okay, on the shirt color, interpretation. Even on music, if I can, there's interpretation. I'm not saying we have it here. I'm not saying it's necessarily right. There's interpretation. But if someone disagrees on one of these, then we are, we are not eye to eye on this. And we have to agree, number one, on the deity of Jesus Christ. He is not just a son of God. He is the son of God. The Bible says the only begotten son. John chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God, and the word was God. Jesus caused quite the consternation when before the Jews, he said, before Abraham was, in our New Testament it says, I am. Now, if you look at that word, what Jesus was saying is in the, um, Exodus, chapter number three, God comes to Moses. He comes to Moses in a burning bush. God's name had not been revealed beforehand in this manner. And Moses asked God, whom will I say sent me? And God from the burning bush says, Yahweh, Jehovah, I am. You tell him I am sent me. God named himself, by the way, and all the names of God show the character of God. I am the self-existing one. And God had now revealed himself to Moses and then to the Israelites as the I am, the self-existing one. When Jesus stood before the Jews and he said, who do you think you are? And he said, before Abraham was, I'm Jehovah. Boy, they, they became unglued. They became unglued. Now, before you fault them too much, they should have known who Jesus was. If someone came up tonight into this pulpit, and if someone were to say, by the way, I'm Jesus Christ, we would also become unglued. We would not say, oh, that's nice. Would you like a water? No, we, we, would, we would get them out, would we not? And if they continued in that, in that realm, we would we'd say, get, get out of here. So before you are too harsh, on the, they should have known from the prophecy. But understand, when he came in, he said, listen, who you're looking for? You're this God you worship? I am him. The only difference was between my story and that one is Jesus is God. We must agree on the deity of Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1 verse 8, But unto the Son he saith, Thy throne, O God, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of thy kingdom. Someone said this, I think it was C.S. Lewis. I am trying, C.S. Lewis said, to prevent anyone from saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. People say this, he said, I am ready to accept Jesus as a great teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. C.S. Lewis said that is one thing that we cannot say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great teacher. Make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else he is a madman or something worse. 
Either you can shut him up for a fool, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. We must agree, first of all, on the deity of Jesus Christ. No ifs, ands, or buts, non-negotiable. If someone does not believe that Jesus is God, all right, then we do not agree fundamentally, we disagree. Number two, number two, the virgin birth. Isaiah 7, 14, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. And Isaiah, he said, uh, what shall I show you for a sign? And they wouldn't give him a sign. He said, therefore, the Lord himself shall give you a sign. This is what God said. I will show you that I am God. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. A fundamental truth is that Jesus Christ was born of a virgin woman, a woman who had known no man. Jesus' earthly mother was Mary, and his father was God. He did not have an earthly father. If Jesus had an earthly father, he could not save us from our sins. The virgin birth is fundamental to our belief system. Back to the virgins, if I can for a moment. I read to you from the King James Version. The newer versions, for many years, changed that and said this, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a young woman will conceive and give birth to a son. Now, think about this for a moment, but you're thinking caps on. If I said to you, I'm going to show you a tremendous earth-shattering sign. A young woman's going to have a baby. Wow, that's never happened before. Which, by the way, congratulations to Clarence and Brittany Nettles. Little young Titus was born this morning. Then you born about 925 was a word I got. I know no other details yet, though I'm sure he was so long. Oh, there it is. Oh, look at that. Man, see, that's the kind of tech staff we have right there. Apparently, he was 7 pounds, 9 ounces, 20 and a half inches long. Titus O'Neill Nettles. And he's not scaling. I don't know if you saw that, that, uh, um, ultrasound he was scowling looks like he's smiling there so Clarence you got a smiler well, congratulations to them but but it's not a sign it's not a sign if a young woman if a young girl has a baby that's just the way life kind of works right it is a sign if a virgin lady conceived by the Holy Ghost has a child that's a sign from the Lord there was so much consternation that now what they put in there, it says now, I'm reading from the NIV tonight, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. B, in parentheses, look down underneath, or young woman. So we'll put in there what you want to hear, but underneath you'll know that's not really what it's supposed to say. Listen, if, if the virgin birth is not there, if the virgin birth is not real, then we don't have a savior then we are on our way to a devil's hell, separated from God. The virgin birth is fundamental. Number three, number three, the blood atonement. The blood atonement. Acts 20, verse 28. Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Ephesians 1, 7, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Years ago, there was a well-known, well-known preacher who also in print and in sermon wrote that the blood of Jesus was not necessary for sacrifice. It was Jesus' violent death. Now, Jesus did die in a violent death. The cross... And crucifixion was not a pleasant way to die. Preparing now for Easter and um, looking at some of those things again about the beating, the savagery that was done to our Lord and Savior. It was violent. But my forgiveness of sins and your forgiveness of sins, the Bible says, is not based upon the violence of his death, but his precious blood. There must be a blood atonement. And that's the only thing that is the atonement. 
Nothing else will do. No amount of works, nothing I can do uh, is good enough. The only thing that can save me is the precious blood, the incorruptible blood of Jesus Christ. I believe, like the Bible, that Jesus' blood is incorruptible. That it is there forever. As it fell to the ground, I believe it's now in heaven with Jesus. The blood of Jesus is there. I believe his blood is incorruptible. So the Bible says, for we are not redeemed with corruptible things such as silver or gold, but with the incorruptible. It's incorruptible. One scholar once asked, well, what about his fingernails? I don't know. The Bible doesn't talk about his fingernails, does it? It does talk about his blood. And the blood atonement, atoning or the forgiveness of sins by the blood of Jesus is a fundamental of the faith. If I add anything to the blood of Jesus Christ, then the blood of Christ is not sufficient. So if I have to do one thing, then I'm saying the blood atonement and something else. Salvation is through the precious blood of Jesus Christ, not his blood and me being nice to my wife and me helping an old lady cross the street and me getting baptized and me whatever. Add anything you wanted to it, anything else, and, and keeping uh, everything that, that, that the, the priest says or the, the sacraments. Anything else that I add to it now nullifies the blood of Jesus. My Bible says the only thing that atones sin, the only thing is the blood of Jesus Christ. Only thing. Fundamental to the faith. Number four, the bodily resurrection. The bodily resurrection. Here's that passage from 1 Corinthians. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, and wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you, first of all, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures, and that he was seen of Cephas, that is Peter, then of the twelve. Paul in, in continues in the chapter, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and you can look at it later on or tonight or tomorrow. Paul argues about the resurrection. And he says, if the resurrection did not really take place, and understand that when that happened, soldiers, big conspiracy, paid off, all those things. You've got to conceal this whole matter. They've stolen his body. They've done all these things to it. He couldn't really have risen from the dead. All right, all those things to just to, to blanket over the fact that Jesus Christ actually rose from the dead. But Paul argues in 1 Corinthians 15 that if Jesus did not rise from the dead, our faith is in vain, and we are of all men most miserable. Paul says if Jesus isn't alive, then he's a liar. He's not God. He couldn't die for our sins. You know what? You're just wasting your time. And beyond that, you're hurting your life. You're of all men most miserable. Bodily resurrection, key to the gospel. I remember one question out of my New Testament survey class my freshman year. How many of the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John, contain the resurrection of Jesus Christ? The answer, all four. Without the gospel, without the resurrection, there's no gospel, there's no good news. All four, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all contain the resurrection of Jesus Christ. On a side note about the versions, if you go to the book of Mark, in chapter 16, verse 9 through 20, many of the modern versions will not have that in there. They think that was added by an overzealous scribe. Just so you know, that's the passage in Mark that deals with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Not only some other things. But all four contain the resurrection of Jesus Christ fundamental to our faith. Number five, the last fundamental, the deity of Jesus Christ, the virgin birth, the blood atonement, the bodily resurrection. Number five, the inerrancy, the inerrancy of Scripture. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. There are a lot of good books out there, written by a lot of smart people, men and women. Helpful books. Books on, helpful books on, on how to change the oil in your car. Helpful. How to lose weight. Helpful. How to win friends and influence people. Helpful. How to conquer a bad habit. I read one recently called The Power of Habit. It, it, interesting read. Good read. Helpful read. There are a lot of good books written by a lot of smart people. 
But there is only one book written by the God of the universe. And we believe fundamentally that this book is not just man, though God used men, it's written by God. And if someone doesn't believe that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant word of God, then fundamentally we disagree. I'm not talking about translations right now, I'm talking about the actual the Bible itself. That fundamentally we have to agree that this book is God's word to man. And because of that, 2 Timothy tells us, because of that it is profitable. For all these things, reprove, doctrine, correction, instruction, righteousness. Why? That the man of God, and that's not just me, that's everybody, every child of God may be perfect, complete, thoroughly furnished or thoroughly equipped. I'm um, do all good works. You want to be ready for life? The inspired, inerrant word of God. Fundamental to the faith, Psalms 12, verse 6. The words of the Lord are pure words. As silver tried in a furnace of earth, purified seven times, thou shalt keep them, O Lord, thou shalt preserve them from this generation forever. It's just a book? Who cares? It was just some dead man's words? Then maybe we'd reference them and sign them in class. But if they're the living words of God, then I must read them, and I must heed them. These five things are fundamental to our faith. Now, we don't have to be rude. We're not called to be obnoxious. But we're called to strive for the truth. And these five things are fundamental. People can be good people. They can be sincere people. You can be kind to them. You can bake them cookies and be nice. But those are five fundamentals we have to agree on. If someone's going to go to heaven, they have to believe in Jesus Christ. The deity, virgin birth, blood atonement, bodily resurrection, and inerrancy of scriptures. All right?